The war in Ukraine continues despite a lack of media interest. Russian forces have made repeated assaults along the Donbass front and attempted an offensive towards Kharkiv. Perhaps Putin wanted some kind of victory, no matter how insignificant, before the Victory Day parades in Moscow on May the 9th. But this has cost Russia dearly, with a loss of more than 15,000 soldiers killed or wounded, and he has nothing to show for it, except a few pockmarked fields and piles of rubble that used to be villages. What is the point of Putin's war, and when will the Allies finally show him that it is fruitless for him to continue in this aggression? Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like, subscribe, and definitely comment. It massively helps the videos perform. It helps new people to discover the brilliant guests that we feature on the channel. Please also check out the validated Ukrainian charities. It's incredibly important to help Ukraine and its armed forces remain resilient in the face of Russian aggression. After you've done that, check out... Um, Robin's fantastic books, which come highly recommended. And then finally, if you've got anything left at all, uh, perhaps consider buying me a coffee to help support the work of the channel. Robin Horsfeld joined the British Army at the age of 15 in 1972. He served with the Parachute Regiment and 22nd Special Air Service. He left the British Army in 1984 and worked as a mercenary bodyguard and as a medical officer in many active war zones around the world. He then built London Karate for 20 years, teaching thousands the art and discipline of karate. He retired and went to Surrey University age 56 and graduated in English literature and creative writing. Three years later, he is the author, as I mentioned, of several fantastic books, including the highly successful autobiography, Fighting Scared. We will put a mention of that in the description. We'll put links to his website where you can find all of his fantastic creative output. Please do check it out. But um, I should also mention this is not the first time Robin's appeared on the channel. So if you enjoy this video, do go back and check out our previous three conversations. Robin, I'm delighted to welcome you back. Uh, it's good to be back, Jonathan. Nice to see you again. Well, we're going to focus on a bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, um, some of the questions are relatively going to be the same because we have seen not so much stagnation uh, on the battlefield. All sorts of things are happening, and we'll talk about the evolution of warfare, which is proceeding at an extraordinary pace. It's the evolution of Western attitudes towards victory that haven't changed. Is this a source of frustration for you, as I know it is for many others? I think... Um... The world today wants to see things happen very quickly. Um, and history teaches us that big wars take a long, long time, on average five years, to come to some kind of conclusion. And even then, they'll open up again and repeat themselves. So frustration, probably not. Um, understanding of the war situation, yes. The most frustrating part being, of course, is the... Um, the political situation, um, but we live in democracies and democracies um, rely on the consensus, rely on the support of the people, rely on a group decision. And they, these things take time, but when the democracies do come together, then they, and they are focused on one particular aim, then they become unstoppable because they're extraordinarily rich and wealthy, but it does take time. And that's one of the frustrating things about modern politics, especially when we live in a soundbite world, to try and um, understand why things are taking as long as they do. The other aspect of democracy is you can have people in charge who have a, let's say, preponderance of manager skills, i.e. they don't want to take the lead, they just want to keep things going, get re-elected occasionally. Maybe once in a generation, you get genuine leaders. Is one of the concerns at the moment that we have a glut of managers and a paucity of leadership? Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. One of the things that's missing uh, in politics in the Western world is, uh, is leadership. And leadership is not the same at all as management. A manager gets people to do as they're told. The leader inspires people. A leader makes people want to do what he wants. He, they, they believe in his, uh, in, in his dream. 
uh, in where he wants to lead them. And he does lead them. He goes ahead. He sets an example. People aspire to be like him. They want to be part of that dream. And um, sometimes it takes very difficult times before those type of people are allowed to come to the fore because managers who tend to run civil services and so on, they don't particularly like inspiring leaders because they, un they undermine what they're trying to achieve a lot, a lot of the time. They, they break things up. They create change. And um, uh, static uh, systems that operate within governments uh, really do um, bulk at the, uh, the idea of change. Anybody that's going to knock down walls and break bricks and, and change things um, are going to be resisted quite strongly until they're frightened, until there's a war, until somebody's knocking on their door. And then that person will, you know, what is it? Come the day, come the man. And there are other characteristics, aren't there, with managers? Often you will get a lack of imagination because imagination can create instability. It can create sort of the unexpected, which, uh, you know, no managers uh, really like dealing with that. Um, but also it creates a certain level of caution. You don't want to take bold decisions because it requires monetary commitment. It requires you to have difficult conversations with your electorates. So managers may well avoid those difficult, complex situations and be cautious. Are we not seeing this at the moment as well, especially in the terms of uh, Berlin and Washington's attitudes to Ukraine? They are, to use a phrase that's been suggested to me, coercively controlled by Moscow's terror threats uh, into being far more timid than the situation requires. I, I don't think that the um, terror threats of nuclear war are um, having the effect that the Russians want. Um, I think it's a bit of a case of Peter and the wolf. You know, they, they keep crying, we're going to have terrible consequences, you're going, to, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Medvedev the drunk is... Uh, constantly repeating, uh, saying things that Putin won't say himself. To just create the fear in the Western world that um, is going to affect public opinion. But public opinion have grown bored with it. They're not listening to it anymore. And I uh, don't think they really are that petrified of that idea. There's an awful lot of doubt now spreading around the um, higher levels of the um, of government. But um, there's a lot of doubt as to whether the um, Russian nuclear deterrent would actually work because of the corruption that's taken place, the uh, lack of maintenance that's taken place in their whole military structure. It's highly, uh, it's high, it's possible, but not definite, that um, their nuclear weapons wouldn't actually function. Um, it's um, interesting to see that Ukraine has uh, taken out some of their early warning systems to do with the nuclear attack. I mean, that's... Um, that's an interesting target factor to take into effect. But uh, you know, there's um, but the the idea of oh, we're going to, we're going to end the world, it, it never really had a lot of it never really carried a lot of weight because you're asking the Russians to commit suicide, you're asking the Russians to kill their own families, you're asking the Russians to directly lose the war. There's nothing for them to gain. Ben Hodges repeats this constantly. He says, you know, there's nothing in it for them, and so the world stopped listening. What the world is uh, really concerned about is maintaining the um, energy supplies, uh, making sure that there's enough oil and gas for Europe for the winters and um, and so on. That That's important, that uh, Ukraine is holding the front line while the Russian economy is undermined. Um, those those are the big things that are really important. And the the Russian way of negotiating is very interesting because they come in to a negotiation, as to into a negotiation, as if they're the victors, as if uh, demanding everything, insisting that everything be given to them, knowing that you know that they're hoping, in fact, that they're going to end up with something at the end of the line. I mean, they only negotiate when they when they're concerned. They never negotiate from. They never get negotiate from strength. When they're feeling strong, they just conquer. They'll just roll over everything. They'll demand. They'll insist, and they'll take. Um, at the moment. There's feeds going out um, from Putin about negotiations again. And I think it's possible that this is the first time that Putin is starting to put feeders out about negotiation from a position of weakness. Um, his economy is be being undermined. 
his logistical system, his um, political ability to form and make another mobilization. These are all under in question right now. So um, I think um, I think things are going in the right direction. But you wouldn't believe that if you listen to an awful lot of the national media. And of course, they struggle, don't they, to um, to use the right terminology. So they will use a word like negotiation, but negotiation for a Western diplomat or for Western politicians is sort of one thing. In fact, not even Western. There are many countries around the world who understand the concept of negotiating in good faith. Whereas what Russia means by negotiation is something very, very different. As you say, it's more of a, a series of demands and threats um, based on the idea that uh, if you, you know, if you demand this much, you might get, you know, you might get less than you demanded, but uh, still walk away with something you didn't have before. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the, I think their plan currently is to try to walk away with the um, territories that they've invaded and conquered. Um, that's not going to happen as I see it. Um, I don't think the Ukrainians are going to consider the last two years of sacrifice um, worthwhile if they suddenly say, OK, you know, you can have what we fought for and lost all our people for for the last two years. And they know the Russian mind. Nobody knows the Russian mind better than the Ukrainian people. They know exactly what tactics that Putin is using and they know how to counter them. And they know that almost everything he says is a, a device. It's a lie. It's designed to create an advantage and nothing but an advantage with a long term view um, of going back there 10 years later when they've restored their military strength and going again. Um, so, no, um, the war's not going to come to an end in a short space of time. The Ukrainians are going to continue to resist and the Ukrainians can win, providing they continue to have the support of the Western world and especially the United States of America. And that's especially important as potentially China uh, weighs in more on the side of Russia. There is a, a risk of that happening. We already know that North Korea and Iran are major suppliers of munitions. Um, there are plenty of pictures that have gone around showing that North Korea has been retooling and scaling up its uh, military industrial complex explicitly to supply Russia. In your view, should we be taking this sort of alliance of autocracies far more seriously in giving Ukraine what it needs in a timely fashion, in fact, giving an overabundance of what they need rather than eking everything out to the point where it becomes extremely risky on their side? I don't think there's a genuine alliance of the autocracies. Um, they're all looking to gain an advantage for themselves. I mean, China is not directly uh, a supporter of Russia. Um, North Korea has got rid of very old stocks of ammunition in return for something it needs. Um, China is sitting back and thinking about Chinese interests. Um, it wants security on its borders. It wants security in the South China Sea. Um, everybody brings the focus back onto Taiwan, but I don't think that's a uh, that's something that is a genuine threat right at this moment. You know, um, there's no evidence of a military buildup uh, that's going to um, or that's going to threaten Taiwan at the moment. Um, overflights, threats, noises, saber rattling. You know, that's been going on for since the Second World War. Um, but China's interests are, chi are all about China. Um, they do not want to go to war. Their economy is struggling at the moment after COVID. And um, so there's nothing really in it for them. What's in it for them is to have Russia um, beholden to them, have Russia asking them for help. Um, if you go back to the um, 1950s and the Korean War, it was Stalin that ruled the whole communist world. It was Stalin that bonded everything together. But that's not the case anymore. Russia isn't powerful enough. And now that its oil economy is starting to crumble, it's not rich enough to have enough influence that China, China's rising but it's rising on the chinese russian border um i think that there's um, a certain amount of we we must always be concerned but i don't think that it's the biggest threat at the moment the big threat to world security to oil security to energy security is obviously russia 
Russia supported by Iran more than anybody else. Um, their interests coincide very, very strongly in the Middle East as much as anywhere else. So I think that the attack by Hamas, the appalling attack by Hamas into Israel was directed with, uh, um, after, after um, Russian influence took its place. Um, there was a meeting be between the leaders of Iran and um, Russia two weeks before the Hamas attack. It was a deliberate, a deliberate distraction to take world attention away from what's going on in Ukraine. And it succeeded very well, and it's still going on. I think that the um, financing of uh, protests in universities and on the capitals throughout the world are, are funded um, by supporters of Russia and probably coming directly from Iran. Um, it's too well coordinated and too big not to be funded by somebody quite large. So it's um, it's a success, a successful way on the global stage of actually distracting people away from the big war. The big war is taking place in Ukraine, the most important war to Western democracy. The biggest threat to Western democracy is the war in Ukraine. And um, I wish the, the world media would start to pay far more attention to that again. And that idea of strength versus weakness and the fact that the media often will swing between, uh, you know, extremes of, you know, um, lionizing some of Ukraine's victories to throwing their hands up and saying, well, it's all over and Ukraine's lost and it's going to be fully occupied. To those, I think, you know, like you and I watching this day in, day out, that doesn't seem realistic. But clearly Putin is gearing his economy up for the long haul, as you say. He realizes this is a long war. And he realizes that unless he delivers some kind of success, his own position is in jeopardy. How, therefore, do you interpret the purge of the generals that is currently happening? Um, and very much it is reported by Russian sources that the intrusion of the FSB and the security services into the traditional bastions of army power are increasing dramatically. It's back to the Stalinist system of government, the old Stalinist communist system of communist system of government. The um, model that Putin has based his uh, leadership on, now he's at war, is um, he's he's referring back to a Stalin system of purging the leaders and uh, threatening the next level below and saying if you don't get the results you'll be purged as well. And with Stalin, you should just simply kill them, you know, or send them off to the gulag. But, um, you know, there's not a lot different happening here, here. You know, remove them, shame them, take away their medals, uh, put them in prison sometimes, and then um, and then replace them with more obedient, more willing, more frightened commanders. Um, but the thing is, he doesn't have the strength of forces to do what he's actually attempting to do. And his generals know that. And every time he removes a level, he removes a level of competence. He removes that hierarchy of competence down to a lower level. And we can see this in the methods that the Russians are using on the front lines. They are failing to establish attacks that are bigger than maybe two brigades, maybe 10,000 men at a time. And they're getting defeated or counterattacked uh, and stopped. And maybe they take a piece of rubble. Maybe they take a few fields. But the cost is absolutely enormous. Whereas if you go back to the Second World War, where um, Stalin had a, an army of five million men on the front line, you know, he could concentrate forces and hold the front lines. Um, neither side, Ukraine or Russia, have enough forces to man the front lines and concentrate forces elsewhere. And until somebody gets that, then nobody's going to actually penetrate far enough to make a huge difference. But where Ukraine have the advantage is that they're funded by the Western world. And Russia isn't. And you mentioned um, that Russia is uh, tooling up into a war economy now. But they're funding that war economy with their National Wealth Fund. They're not bringing in enough income to support it. So an estimates have been made by the World Bank that they're, they're only going to be able to manage this for about another 12 to 18 months. And then that National Wealth Fund is going to run out. So how are they going to pay the companies that they've turned onto a war footing. 
uh, to keep manufacturing. They're not going to be able to do that. Are they going to produce? Are they going to return to a slave economy? Because it's not going to work. Um, and I'm sure that Putin's bankers are telling him this. It's a short-term fix. Um, he's got to find some way of creating revenue. And he's not creating revenue. His revenue is diminishing, whereas Ukraine's revenue is increasing, providing that we keep supporting them, providing especially the USA keeps supporting them. And this is very interesting because, of course, again, if you look at even some analysts, they're saying, OK, well, we've got this new economist. He's Minister of Defence. He's going to change this, this and this. And, you know, and, and, and yet again, we're back to where we were three years ago, which is overestimating the capacity of the Russian system to change, overestimating their strength, uh, overestimating their organisation and ignoring the fundamentals of nepotism, corruption, etc., I mean, my view of this minister of economics, he's a Soviet era central economy planner. I think he understands he's not going to be able to tackle these endemic problems of uh, corruption, nepotism, because they're not aberrations to the system. They are the system. They'd have to dismantle everything. I think he's been brought in as someone who can requisition resources and do exactly what you say, turn chunks of the economy into essentially, um, uh, you know, property of the state and re-steal back what all their minions have been busy stealing over the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, it's a, it, it level, levels of incompetence all the way down. The greatest friend in many ways that the, the Ukrainian generals have is Putin himself, because he was never uh, a military commander and he doesn't trust his military commanders. In fact, the military commanders he's had until now have not been military commanders. They've been a chief administrators. They haven't been people that have been actively working and controlling uh, armies in, in war zones. So, you know, it's hardly surprising that their level of incompetence is so high. Um, the Ukrainians have a saying that we're very lucky because they're so stupid. And that applies uh, That applies right across um, the whole Russian government, especially the Russian military. And even when you get generals that are prepared to turn around and say, this is ridiculous, this isn't working, you're making big mistakes, they get fired. Um, so, you know, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot constantly on the front lines. But also I'd add to that that I think Putin uh, knows that uh, he's not getting anywhere on the military front. So he's going to use other forms of warfare, economic warfare, um, undermining the um, undermining the um, beliefs of the Western world, undermining the confidence of the Western world, frightening the Western world, using threats, um, using the manipulation of the media, using social media, um, attacking um, elections, is a very, very powerful way for him to uh, place, a, place a different piece on the chessboard that will come from the flanks, that will come in from the side and will affect the actual ability to, to maintain and continue uh, war on behalf of Ukraine. Those are the methods he's going to be using. But in the meantime, his economy is crumbling. His oil and gas isn't getting sold. His refineries, which are um, a high return part of the system are being constantly attacked and destroyed. His airfields are being destroyed. Um, his infrastructure is being destroyed because he doesn't have access to high-tech um, digital systems anymore. And so he's aware of that. And I think at the moment he's, he's playing the game of, I've got to get a victory in the next 12 months, or I'm going to have to look for a different way of winning this so you mentioned here what essentially are sort of warfare in the grey zone. Would you expect to see uh, things like sabotage? Um, we've seen a number of sort of fires and suspected uh, provocations throughout Europe uh, over the last couple of months. It's difficult to tie those sometimes back to Russian agents, but a pattern seems to be emerging. So do you see expect to see a lot more of these sort of so-called unexpected provocations and ones that are designed to be under the radar for article five serious enough to to have an impact and get us worried not serious enough to trigger a direct confrontation i i think we've seen that since the start of this war i'm 
personally very convinced that the um, many Western governments have been infiltrated by Russian sleepers. Now, that's is a wonderful conspiracy theory. But you see what people do when people behave in ways that seem to be irrational, they were in power, then one has to ask the question, why? And it's not insanity. It's either fear or greed. And usually it's fear. And um, when you take somebody who perhaps has been a visitor to Russia and has been given all the luxuries that his desires um, can, can ever, ever wish for, um, and, and they're on film, they can be held and used 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, and I'm very, very, very sure that the Russians have the, um, the, uh, they have the information on certain people. I also think that other, you know, on the other side of it, the greed factor, where people have been funded, they've been um, supported with money, which has been hidden through various accounts and shell accounts and all sorts of things um, to support them and get them into positions of political authority. And now somebody's saying, well, we can expose this and bring you right down. They're, they're those, th those are the things that really matter. Blackmail, it matters. Um, it's, a, it's a political weapon. And it's used by every side, not just the Russians, but the Russians have always been the absolute best at it. When you look at McLean and Blunt, they were volunteers. They were, they were willing uh, participants. Um, what, you, what you also have, you have the willing participants, you have the greedy participants, you have the frightened participants, and you have the useful idiots as well. People who are flattered into feeling important. And Russians are absolutely expert. The KGB, FSB, the world leaders in undermining systems like that. And I think that's been going on. And some of those sleeper systems have been put into place in Europe, uh, I think particularly in Germany and in the USA. Um, we see it in the media. Um, it's not just in government. It's also in media where uh, people are in positions of uh, authority in the media now. And it's not that people aren't writing. It's not that journalists aren't protesting. It's the person who decides whether it gets on the screen, whether it gets in the newspaper, that really, really count. And there's there's an awful lot of good information and good journalism being suppressed in that way too, which is one of the reasons I'm, I get out on these podcasts and write my own stuff. Yes, yes. Create the narrative when uh, when the mainstream one is really insufficient to the task. Um, what we also see, now unfortunately we know that the Russian military system uh, is is not particularly inventive. And you say it's extremely hierarchical where people who challenge authority are suppressed. That, however, has not prevented some innovations taking place. And glide bombs are just such an innovation which seem to be having a devastating effect on the battlefield. They are a cross, I think, between terror weapon and a um uh, you know, more modern precision weapons. What is your view on the emergence of glide bombs? And I'm not sure. My understanding is that there is not an adequate air defence solution to uh, countering them at the moment. Yeah, and um, the glide bomb is just one piece of the Russian arsenal, but it's uh, one of the few that's having a very, very dramatic effect. Um, it's still being poorly used in most cases. It's not being used specifically against uh, strategically important targets. It's, it's also being used against uh, population areas as well. Um, at the moment, the reason it's, it's working so well is because the air defense systems uh, can't quite reach to the launch sites. But with, the, um, with uh, some permissions being uh, achieved now where, uh, of using Western technology over, over the Russian border, um, it might well see them getting pushed back further and further. And we're seeing reports of Russian Russian pilots dropping weapons short of the defence lines, knowing that they're going to get shot down if they go too close. Um, the glide bombs are devastating to the targets they hit, um, but they're not making a huge strategic difference to the battle battle space, to the uh, to the areas that are very very important. They're not enabling. Um, Russia to penetrate, to get through the um, defence lines of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's a huge country and um, they, can, they can simply give up space, uh, cost the Russians huge amounts of men and materiel and give up a little bit more space. And if we look at 
we step back from the from the map and take a look at how much gain Russia has actually made uh, this year, for example. If you look at the if you look at the whole the whole plan, they they haven't made hard, they've made hardly any gains at all. Tiny little villages, short amount, small amounts of fields, um, pushing forwards, counterattacks backwards. It's all small, tune up to brigade level attacks that achieve absolutely nothing. They just keep the pressure on the Ukrainian armed forces. But the Ukrainian armed forces um, seem to be costing Russia a seven to one, giving giving Russia a seven to one cost in this. For every individual soldier killed in, U in the Ukrainian armed forces, there are seven being killed in the Russian armed forces. And conservative figures that have come out this week state that Russia has, has, has had more than 500,000 men killed in the last two years, killed. Um, and they've supported that by saying, well, they've had 300,000 applications for pensions for soldiers killed in the war. So statistics are coming out from administrative sources. Um, so Russia's suffering very, very badly. Um, I don't think that the glide bombs are going to make a huge difference to the actual battlefield. They're going to kill people. They're going to um, they're going to cause a lot of concern, but they're not going to change the war. What we're also hearing is that there is accelerated evolution in drone warfare. And of course, we see the footage of uh, sort of uh, FPV drones taking out vehicles, even individuals. Uh, and of course, there's some, some debate about that. Uh, it's fairly sort of gruesome and unpleasant stuff. But behind the scenes, there seems to be an extraordinary evolution of military tactics and techniques that incorporate uh, drone technology. But we're also seeing a kind of arms race with electronic warfare. What is your sense of that and how quickly things are moving? Well, the drone war is uh, changing and uh, very quickly because it's a new it's a new um, vector. It's a new uh, dimension in the war um, to be able to have eyes in the sky everywhere all the time to be able to. You don't need your forward artillery controller on the ground. Uh, spotting the drop of shot, he can actually sit in an office a uh, hundred miles away uh, with his eyes in the sky and direct uh, and direct artillery. Um, you can fly these drones down into trenches. You can fly them through front doors. Um, they're very, very, very effective. They're not as effective as uh, heavy artillery in mass coming down to stop armed forces, but they're they're working. They're filling. They fill the great gap. Uh, over the last six months, when um, the GOP and the, and the Republican Party in the USA uh, created this pause in supply, um, you know, so drone drone warfare is the new warfare. It's it's Judge Dread. Um, they're flying, they're watching, they're looking all the time. Nobody can move. Um, you know, the the job of a soldier is to destroy the enemy. Now, uh, people talk about you know the 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 fact that you know you cannot. Um, you cannot uh, fight a war without killing people. And so, you know, when people get out of tanks and run away, they're getting hit by cluster munitions. They're getting chased down by drones um, that are dropping grenades on them. You know, you've got to take the enemy out. That's that's the nature of war. Um, it's about killing. It's, um, it's, it's, it's murder on behalf of, illegal murder on behalf of your government. Um, and that's what we do. Um, it's um, the Ukrainians are leading the technology. Ukrainians are pushing forward. The Russians are learning quickly and catching up. The big problem they have is that they um, don't have the high tech support from behind the lines that um, that Ukraine has. It's not just Ukraine. It's the Western powers. It's Western scientists. It's American scientists. It's people that know what they're doing and they can push this harder and faster. And of course, they can make money out of it, which is the great um, uh, the great motivator. You know, we can make money, we can improve these drones, we can put um, artificial intelligence on them, we can go out and search minefields, um, we can identify the enemy when he thinks he's hidden, we can see them move at every level. Um, it's, it's a marvellous piece of technology and it is changing modern warfare. And the big one, of course, is the, is the marine drones, the ones that are sitting, on, um, sitting in the sea, sinking 27 Russian ships and 
and one submarine. They're sinking everything. They're uh, <laughs> they're knocking out um, everything at sea. They forced the Russians out of the Black Sea and into the Sea of Azov. You know, so dr the marine drones. I mean, an awful lot of the modern navies today are going to have to look very very closely at the future of their ships and how they're going to work and um, how they're going to operate as a Navy in the future. Because when you can put small uh, boats into the sea and um, sink capital ships um, from a distance without any risk to life, it's, 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 it's a huge gain. Now, what's your confidence in our own uh, governments and militaries uh, decision-making and logistics capacity to actually learn these lessons of drone warfare um, and in some senses, are we behind the Ukrainians now? I don't have very much confidence in the British Armed Forces' ability to learn anything at the moment. And that's not their fault. It's the fault of this government and previous previous governments going back for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, the uh, British Armed Forces have been reduced to a hollow force. Um, there's just enough left to produce a harder that could be built on in an emergency with conscription. But, um, you know, the, the, one of the things I took great offence at was when um, Ben Wallace turned around and said, we're investing more in the military than we ever have before, except in manpower. Well, there's nothing the Ukrainian war shows us that's more important than manpower. You can have all the technology. You can have the drones. You can have the electronic warfare. You can have the tanks. But you've got to have the men in the trenches. You've got to have the numbers. And if it wasn't for the fact that Ukraine has managed to put two hundred to 800,000 men in the field, then nothing else would count. Um, and we don't have enough men to defend Dover in the armed forces. We have 68,000 at the last count of regular soldiers, of which only 25,000 are teeth arms. That's artillery, infantry and armour. I mean, what can you defend with that? The Ukrainian armed forces have wiped out the equivalent of seven British armies in the last in the last two years. The British army is unfortunately a sad, hollow shell of what it used to be when I joined nearly fifty years ago, and it's um, it's a terrible shame that we uh, are stuck with this. That the People that have been in charge of governments going right back to Blair um, are, have failed to realise that the defence of the realm relies on numbers in the armed forces, not just clever little guys sitting in an office flying a drone somewhere or launching a missile or flying, you know, or flying one aircraft to, you know, to create a breach in the um, Russian armed forces. The, um, we've sat on the tails of the Americans I mean, I, I, I thoroughly despise Donald Trump, but there's one thing that he said, and that was that, you know, that, that we haven't done our share. We've relied on America for far too long uh, to do the fighting, to produce the manpower. Well, it's absolutely fascinating that you mentioned the whittling down of the army in terms of numbers, strength, capabilities, because we're now in an election cycle. And it strikes me that there are two incredibly important things that politicians should be talking about but perhaps that may not be top of their agenda. One is clearly expressing how Ukraine can win and what we need to do to support that victory. The other one, of course, is the policy towards the army. And here we do have some pronouncements, but I'm not sure they're the right kind of pronouncements because what you've been describing is that we need a effective fighting force, a professional army with the right equipment, the right training and the right scale. But the debate seems to be going down the rabbit hole of national service. Yeah, Rishi Sunak has come out knowing that it's highly unlikely that the Conservatives are going to hold on to power. And he's come out with this vote-grabbing populist um, idea about bringing back national service. And obviously has given it no thought at all. Um, the idea of national service would, be, uh, would take at least a decade to bring back in. You've got to rebuild the whole structure. You've got to have the carders that are going to control it. You've got to have the instructors. You've got to have the camps that, that can hold these people, the accommodation, the clothing, the equipment, and so on. 
And what makes it so obviously political rather than military is that they're saying, oh, but they wouldn't have to go into combat. So what's the point of having a national service system training people to be soldiers if you can't use them in a combat situation? Um, I know they train them for a year, there'll be reserves, but that's not the same as professional soldiers. And it would be enormously expensive. And the other side to it with the modern world is the changes in military law, the changes in civilian law, whereas, um, you know, how are you going to stop these young people that are coerced into military service, uh, national service, uh, from claiming that their human rights have been breached and sitting down on the sofa and saying, I refuse to soldier because I've been offended. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't see uh, anything happening unless they were prepared to make changes to military and civilian law again to make it possible to impose discipline on um, groups of uh, young men, particularly, who um, are going to be trained uh, in, uh, in in military in military service. Um, what would be a better system would be to build on what we have, um, to expand the armed forces, to use what remains of our armed forces as a core, as a harder to rebuild up to um, maybe 1970s numbers of about 150 to 180,000 in the army, and then another and the same numbers in the Navy and the Air Force. And where young people are concerned, there's an awful lot of young people who are being forced to stay at school from the age of 16 to 18 when they really aren't academic, they really don't want to be there, and give them the option saying, well, you know, we've got um, junior service from the age of 16 to 18 where you cannot be used for military for, for combat service, but you can do apprenticeships, you can do um, leadership, you can uh, learn skills, you can have adventure, and you um, and you will have mentorship and guidance and pay, and you will be the soldiers of the future. You will be the leaders of the future, which is something I bought into when I was 15 years old, um, because it the world is full of young people with huge amounts of potential who um, are not being used and not being given opportunity. And the military was in the 1970s and 60s a place of opportunity for those stuck in mining towns, in industrial areas where there and places where um, industry was in decline, where they were from unhappy homes. Um, they, they had a place to go where they could have something to belong to, a new family, something of value and a career and a future, a long term future. Um, but governments that seem to be refusing to consider that. Um, and I think that that would be a far better way because you'd have an army of volunteers and I could sell it. I could sell it on, on under those um, under those principles quite easily. I could get out there and say, you need to do this. You need to take these opportunities. This is where it could take you. National service. No, it's not going to work. It won't work because of because the world, especially the world in Britain, has changed too much to go backwards. And I think it's just a silly, pointless, uh, populist idea that a lot of people that don't think very carefully about it are going to say, yeah, you know, get them off the streets, give them some discipline, sort them out. That's what they need. Um, it's going to be popular with the oldies. It's not going to be popular with 18 year olds, that's for sure. And and it's going to be massively expensive. That's the other thing. It's not a, a money saving scheme. It's going to cost a fortune. It will cost a fortune, I suppose, in a sense that you can say people on national service will be on low wages, and that might be equivalent to the money that they would get from benefits if they weren't doing anything. Um, but, um, you know, the, the idea that you, when I, when I was a young man, you could uh, take young people and you could shout at them and coerce them and, and push them and shake them and break them down and build them up again. And they they were... Most of the young soldiers, the best young soldiers of the past, were bad boys. They came from the back streets of the of the of the of the, of the cities across the UK. Um, they weren't going to university. Um, they weren't going to stay in for the sick form. Even they were going to be um, digging holes in streets and uh, building walls and working in Tesco and sh driving trucks. And all of a sudden, this opportunity to be soldiers and learn skills, trades, technical skills, um, came along with it. Um, 
that's that's not going to you're not going to have the same type of animal anymore. One of the big problems I think that a modern army has made is that they um, they reject people who have got problems, who have had problems, who have committed petty crime. Um, the bad boys make the best fighting soldiers, not the good boys. I'm afraid that's the truth. And um, until we get back to offering opportunities for the bad boys and girls, but not in the same sense that um, equality plays a, plays, a, plays a factor, but in the sense of who's best for what, for what particular jobs. Um, it could be done. It won't be done because I don't see anybody with enough political strength to do it. And that links very nicely to the last question, I think, on this subject of, of of bad boys and giving them a future. The reverse seems to be happening in Russia. I don't know if you've seen the clips over the weekend, but in Chelyabinsk, there is a group of conscripts who get into a scrap with Wagner, uh, ex-Wagnerites. <clears throat> and what ensues is a couple of hours of street battles um, and then one side runs off and, and, and brings their guns to the fight. What is going to happen when a country that is essentially held together by a strong man, Putin, um, uh, comes to the point where it's being held together by a weak strong man, someone who is not able to crack skulls and control the kind of diverse, um, let's say, gangs or mafia gangs or groups uh, or groups of interest across society, many of whom are quite ready to use violence the drop of a hat. What What is a scenario facing Russia if it does not end this war and focus on its internal problems? Well, what Russia doesn't have is um, what all tyrants fail to have is um, their replacements waiting to step into their shoes. You know, it's not the king is dead, God save the king. It's uh, the king is dead. Now let's all fight to see who's going to be in charge. Um, if Putin crumbles because he loses this war and because he's taken out by his military or the FSB, then I think civil war in Russia is the most uh, likely consequence. I don't think um, that a strong leader will simply step into his shoes. I think there are several generals. I think there are several political leaders that will try to do that but they'll end up forming their own uh, militias, their own sections of the armed forces. Um, and uh, there are already lots of private armies in the Russian state, and uh, they will fight about who's going to be in charge. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, it, it'll undermine the um, stability of the world order. Um, and will we be able to sit outside and watch it happen? I'm not so sure we will. Um, there's um, there's nuclear weapons there. There's um, that uh, could be sold, could be abused, could be used against one another. Um, you know, it's 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 um, it's something that needs to be thought very carefully about. And I think one of the reasons that um, the Western world wants Putin to stay where he is is because the failure, the the the, the removal of Putin isn't necessarily going to be good. This war would be best if it came to an end under Putin. Because what you could see is a, a considerable period of chaos, unlike anything that uh, that was possible, really, from the uh, fall of communism onwards. And even then, I think there was far more cohesion in society in the 90s when I was visiting Russia than there is now. Putin, as many tyrants do, has uh, tried to eliminate anyone who could be potential competition or build their own power base. He's almost yeah. created the foundations for a very chaotic transition. Yeah, we've seen so many oligarchs fall out of windows, um, in other words, be murdered by Putin. Um, anybody that threatens his position, um, that's the way tyrants stay in power. They they destroy their enemies, they kill their enemies. Um it's hard to see how he can keep that going. He's already removing a lot of his generals, but leaving them alive, and that's going to create resentments. Um, there's um, oligarchs now that know it's dangerous to place themselves in a position of vulnerability in any shape or form, even flying an aircraft. 
um, because they can get shot down by Russian missiles. Um, so there's a lot of frightened people at the top of the Russian power structure now who only need the right trigger and um, something, something, something can, something can change very, very quickly. Well, that means there'll be plenty for us to talk about, I think, in a couple of months when we have our next conversation. It's it's never a challenge, in fact. I always thought it'd be a challenge doing these daily uh, to actually find things to talk about. Unfortunately, it's not. There is more than enough uh, to discuss and more than enough analysis and more than enough, of course, tragedy and trauma on the Ukrainian side that we still need to keep talking about and shining a light upon. I strongly recommend to the audience they follow you on LinkedIn, where you uh, post uh, very thoughtful, in-depth, and I think sort of profound comments on what's happening and very sage advice for Western politicians, um, some of whom uh, clearly are are ignoring that. But we, we hope they finally get uh, on board with the, the script soon. But Robin, thanks so much for coming on to the channel. Uh, as always, it's a massive uh, pleasure to speak to you. And hopefully this will help new people to discover your writings as well. Thanks, John. It's been another good morning.